What does it mean to actually live the American dream? The American dream is different for everyone. The American dream is a single mother in a small town doing her best to give her children the education they deserve. The American dream is a young man in the urban city looking up at the skyscrapers around him and dreaming that one day he will run a business in one of them. The American dream is a baby born today who will one day transition from humble beginnings to the presidency of the United States of America. The American dream is realized by anyone who ever dares to hope, dares to create, dares to work hard and strive for something greater. The American dream is the ability to dream for something more and have the opportunity to see that dream become reality. Many streams converging into one mighty river. That's America, the greatest republic this world has ever known. I am Alveda King, and it's my privilege to introduce the America First Policy Institute Center for the American Dream. In 1963, my uncle, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. The dream is alive in the hearts and minds of Americans, and the dream must continue to be advanced. Ronald Reagan told us that freedom is only one generation away from extinction, and never has that reality been more apparent than it is today. My uncle M.L. once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It is time once and for all for there to be equal access and opportunity to live out the American dream. My dream for you is that God will bless every house. The church house, the white house, the congress house, the courthouse, the school house, the bank house, the jail house, my house, your house, America's house, the world house. I believe that America's best days lie ahead. And the best is yet to come. The Center for the American Dream is here to defend our inheritance and create the tomorrow that all Americans deserve. From the womb to the tomb. God bless America. Hello, I'm Dr. Alveda King and have the honor of serving as the chair of the Center for the American Dream at America First Policy Institute. I have the incredible privilege of being with a true patriot today, someone who has devoted her entire life to God and country. She is a mother of three, a devoted wife, a former Marine, and lifelong champion of U.S. veterans. When she was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates, she became the first Jamaican female Republican, first female veteran, and first naturalized citizen delegate to serve in that body. In 2021, she once again made history in Virginia when she was elected as the first black woman to ever hold a statewide office. Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears, thank you so much for being with us today. Lieutenant Governor, it's just wonderful to be here with you. Many people don't know your full story. I'm just learning so many things about you myself. So um, I'd like maybe to start with your family long before mm -hmm. you entered politics when you were in Jamaica. So how did your family decide to come here? Well, you know, in Jamaica, uh, we at the time were a British nation, as America was at one point, but you threw off your British roots faster than we did. And so most of the time when uh, Jamaicans emigrated, they would always go to England. But then the, somewhere in the early 60s, they started coming more to America. Although Marcus Garvey, as you know, came in 1910 or so. Right. Harry Belafonte's parents came, uh, I think it was his mother, 
and in 1919, Colin Powell, you wow. know, his wow. parents came. And so people actually have been coming to America from Jamaica since the early 1900s. And I want you to think about that wasn't too long after slavery ended. That's true. Why are black people coming to America so soon after slavery ended knowing that there were now Jim Crow laws, segregation laws, all of these laws against us? So we have been saying, we don't care what the laws are in America. America is where the opportunities the are. The land of opportunities. The land of opportunities. Absolutely. And so, uh, we, you know, we just ignored those. Right. So my grandfather actually came, I think it was the early 30s, as a fruit picker. Wow. To get some money so he could come back and help raise his family. And then my father came uh, in 1963, August 11th just 17 days before your I have a dream your yeah. uh, uncle Martin Luther King Jr gave his I have a dream speech oh, wow. and so I said to my father years later when I heard the story I said why would you come then it was a really bad time for us you know and he said because this is where the jobs were and I said yeah but you came at the height of the civil rights movement he said this is still where the opportunities were I said well what did you do he said I came with a dollar 75 actually he couldn't remember if it was $1.50 or $1.75. <laughs> so I'm spotting him a quarter. <laughs> and and, and uh, he stayed with his sister for six months until he could find roommates, moved out, uh, and took, of course, several jobs, used that money to put himself through school, got his education and started his career. Wow. Then he came and got me when I was six. And by the way, in Jamaica, it was my job to dust the picture of your uncle that is just about on every wall in every Jamaican's home. Wow. Because, you know, we revered your, your uncle so much. And to go from dusting his photo to actually then meeting his wife right, right here in our capital 20 years ago. And you have that photograph as and well. And I do. You dusted the photo and then you appear in a photo <laughs> in a with his wife. Isn't that Imagine amazing? That. The Lord just works in mysterious ways. God knows ways. our past. Yes, he know? does. So I tell you all that to say that education, as I keep saying, is what lifted my father, my family out of poverty. And it's what will lift all of us out of poverty. And in fact, yesterday I went and visited a school here in Richmond named after your uncle. Unfortunately, the school is not doing very well. Uh, it's of course a black population of children and I, I spoke to the principal and she let me know. I visited through and I was looking at the faces of the children as I was trying to encourage them and they just look so forlorn as if it, it, they just look so dejected and I'm, I'm saying to one of the children, the very first one, and his name is William as a matter of fact, after my, after my father. Wow. And I said, William, what, what makes you want to get up? What gives you joy? And he said, I'm just glad that I live to see another day. Goodness, and that's from a little child. He's in the sixth grade? Yeah. yeah. What is he experiencing at his, and that, that sounds like the, the, the saying of someone who's 40 years old. This child is a 40-year-old child. And I said to myself, you know, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. How is it that they attend a school named after your, your uncle, who, who gives people so much hope, who wants the children to have a future? And this is what we have? And what year is it? Wow. 2022. You know, your uncle gave a speech to, I believe it's the Barrett junior high school in 1967, uh, what was it, six months before he was executed, okay. he was assassinated. And it was called The Blueprint for Your Life. Yes. And, what, and I read it to those young children and I said, in the speech, what he says is, no matter what your sociological problems are, study, study hard. Yes. And then he said, no matter what your economic difficulties, he's saying this to junior high kids yes. in 1967. Absolutely. He says, what? Stay in school. 
burn the midnight oil. If you're going to be a street sweeper, be the best yes. street sweeper. Sweep it like Michelangelo painted pictures. Yes, Sweep do. them like Leontine Price uh, uh, sang operas. Opera. And so that when you die on your tombstone, they will say he was the best street sweeper ever. He did. He did. And I'm looking at these children and I said, this was said in 1967 to students like you. Wow. You've got to make it. You've got to make it. They were suffering then. You're in a different place now. It is 50 some years later. You can make it too. And I am proof. I wasn't even born in America. You have improved. Absolutely. I stepped off the plane, the Pan Am. Remember Pan Am? I do remember I Pan Am. I stepped off Pan Am 737, Boeing 737, when I was six years old and landed at JFK into the South Bronx. And here I stand today to tell you I did nothing special. And that's what I wanted those children to understand yesterday. I did nothing special to get here. All I did was do exactly what your uncle said, stay in school and study. That's it because if they think I had to do something extraordinary, they will never aspire. They will never say, well, Winsome did it. I can do it too. We knew that the second term of President Donald J. Trump would make the first look like prelude. Larry, Linda McMahon, and I were forced to confront our optimism and the president's own agenda for the second term and ask ourselves, what's next? President Trump's making clear he has no intention of fading quietly. Never, ever quit. Former Trump administration officials are launching the America First Policy Institute. And it will focus on America First policy achievements and principles that were implemented successfully during the past four years. The think tank will also push back where these policy principles go off course. What you're seeing today is nothing less in a national debacle. Border Patrol officers are overwhelmed day in and day out. They need support, they need leadership, and they're simply not receiving any of that from the current administration. Hold on, everybody. <laughs> this Green New Deal mentality that we see in the Democrat Party is coming home to roost now. This is a hundred year play for the soul of this country, and the America First Policy Institute will lead the way. Being a part of AFPI, it reminds me when I came to the headquarters of a real War room. America first means to me that we must remain the beacon of hope. Darkness doesn't even exist when there's light. We are carrying the torch forward. America first agenda is all about um, the American people and bringing power back to the people. And at the American First Policy Institute, we believe the best is yet to come. And the best is yet to come. Learn more at AmericaFirstPolicy.com. Never, ever quit. Well, you know, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. also said that he had a dream and it's rooted in the American dream. Mm -hmm. And as you explain this, your grandfather and then your father, your parents, mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. in pursuit Yes. of the American dream. Yes. Education is so important. Now, I don't want to make an assumption, so let me ask you in this manner. So you support quality education mm -hmm. and the parents making those decisions mm -hmm. for their children mm -hmm. and those who pray, we're hoping they're praying as well. And that is for the public school, the private school, the home school, the parochial school. And all education should be good and quality education mm -hmm. that will give hope to our children. Absolutely. A hope and a future, mm -hmm. as Jeremiah 29, 11 said. Yes, ah, it ah, does. Ah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. Well, wow. And we could actually talk about this all day. But some things that I discovered after you became a Marine, and I want to hear about why you decided to be a Marine. Uh -huh. And then you did exactly what you're saying to these young people. You went back to finish in pursuit of your education. Yes. So tell us first, how did you decide to become a Marine? Well, you know, it was never in my plans. And as I say, you can never plan your life, you know. Um, you, you can be prepared yeah. and you can have plans, but you know, God will lead you. So 
I graduated from high school in the Bronx early. Okay. And I used that time to do a few things, and then I was going to start college. I had my whole uh, coursework ready to start that August. Well, in July, the, the month before, my grandmother died, my paternal grandmother. And if there was anyone on earth I knew loved me, it was her. Mm. And when she died, my whole world just crashed. Mm. I was 18. And I was flail I was failing very badly. I, I didn't I had no reason to live. Went back to Jamaica for her funeral, told my mother, well, I'm just gonna stay here and die. Oh, and I was 18 and I really I was didn't know what to she do was with your myself. Anchor at that time. Yes, she was. Yeah. And my mother said, Well, if you're gonna stay here and die, I have rules. And you have to do this, you have to do that, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And I thought, well, when I'm in America, nobody tells me what to do. <laughs> but I didn't know what to do. I, yeah. I just, I knew I was not going to stay with her. Yeah. You know, I'm 18, you know, just yeah. getting my, you know, feet under me. And, and she had a, a jet magazine on her dining room table. Okay. And so I picked it up and it flipped open to a picture of a Marine with the words, the few, the proud, the Marines. I said, Yes, the Marines. The Marines will give me a reason to live. Oh, my goodness. And that's how I became a Marine. Wow. Because uh, I, I said I needed the discipline. And let me tell you, the, the, the Marines, yeah, they will shape you up very quickly. And I had a New York attitude because I was raised in New York. And they told me, you know, you're not going to make it. But they knew exactly what to say and how to say it and to whom. Because if they had said that to somebody else, they might have said, yeah, throw me out. Wow. But they saw something in me that knew that, no, no, she doesn't like to fail. And so when I heard that, oh, I shaped up very quickly. So that's how I got into the Marine Corps. And it has really informed just about everything I do. Wow. Now, I do have to say this. A lot of people say, well, the things that I do are bold or, or whatever, and they attribute it to the Marine Corps. No, no. Marines, yes. But the overriding, over arching reason why I do what I do is because of God, because I know there is no one greater. No, When God opens a door, no one can shut it, no matter what you do. That's true. And that's back to that Jeremiah passage. I know I have the plans for you. Yes. His plans, of course. Of course. And guiding you into each of these paths. So it is incredible with the Lord leading your steps mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. And you've come from Jamaica, you have overcome the loss. Mm -hmm. of your human mm -hmm. anchor mm -hmm. and you discovered that God is your anchor mm -hmm. and he still is today mm -hmm. and so how did you come from being a marine to directing a homeless shelter oh there's a lot of life in there so um I was also by the way a single mother in between all that while okay. I was in the marines I became a single mother okay and uh but I was always out on uh, deployments and, and playing war games somewhere. And so other people were raising my raising child. And so I knew that that was not going to work. Okay. And uh, so I, I was uh, got out of the Marine Corps and got married and we had uh, other children, but I'd always wanted to go to law school. Okay. You know, I never forgot that. And it, I, I, I didn't want to be 40 and wonder what if, okay. you know, what if I had tried. Well, I needed to get my degree. My husband already had his degree, Marine officer, by the way. I did not meet him until I got out. So, okay. um, you know, there's a lot of fraternization that a Marine Corps frowns on very, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And and so I, we, we, we had our children and then we moved back to Virginia. We were stationed in California, moved back to Virginia. And I, we he took a less paying job so that I could go to school and he could be home more. We sold one of our vehicles and I took my last child, our last child, uh, to daycare on his bicycle. <laughs> oh, yes, goodness. on the back seat of the bicycle, not a bike, a bicycle. Determination as the yes. family working together. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that what amazing? Dropped do. her off at daycare yeah. and went on and did my classes. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not telling people I don't know the struggle. I do know the struggle. I started college when I was 25, had three children under five. Wow. Yes. Wow. So my husband and, and one car, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, but we did it. We did it.
And in, in the whole process, I, you know, I, I took the LSAT, you know, for, for law school, passed it. But then I thought, why do I really want to be a lawyer? And, and none of the reasons were any good. And I knew that I would not survive if, if I'd done it. And so I decided to do something else. You know, I worked for the Chamber of Commerce, business. Okay. And uh, then I worked with uh, the Homeless Shelter for Women and Children, which is a whole other story about how the Lord worked that out. But it was the most, it was the best job I ever had because I could see that if I could put hope into lives that they could blossom. But the thing I realized is that if the people you're trying to help don't want that help, there is nothing you can do. Until they want, they it, want it, you can't make people want good that you want for them. Mm -hmm. And so some people we couldn't help because even though we were a homeless shelter, it wasn't bottom for them. Where wow. we see that it's bottom, it's not. And I had to let some women go, unfortunately. And sometimes the police would come and arrest the women in the homeless shelter because of the drugs or other issues. Right. And I had to shield the children from seeing their mothers being arrested. It's, it's something else. I had to provide for their education, find family, you know. Um, so I know the population that we try to help. It's not something new to me. And then I did a prison ministry for men about four years ago until they closed uh, the detention center. Every, every Wednesday, six o'clock, for two years I did it. Loved it, speaking hope into the lives of men. Wonderful. And so I would say that you are a well-rounded, well-anchored woman, and that being a wife and a mother does not deter a woman from fulfilling her no, destiny. No, no, no. Uh, we, we are so many things mm -hmm. that, you know, we're not just one or the other. We are wives, or maybe not wives, or mothers, maybe not mothers, uh, caregivers, you know. We can be legislators. You we are can. owners of business, Absolutely. which I was, and we are we are whatever we you know wish to be if we have the talent and the fortitude and whatever else. Yeah, we can be all things. I think maybe Who not all things, but some possess. things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I want to do a little bit of wordplay, and uh, you bring me back to center on this one. Your name is Winsome. Uh huh. And when I think about your political adventures, uh -huh. I would say you win some and uh -huh. you lose some. Uh -huh. But your philosophy is this, you've not lost anything. Oh, no. So explain no. to us, no. talk about some of your political races and uh -huh. your successes. And I imagine that was success in every one of them. Well, yeah, see, my first race, the first race I ever ran was to be a state legislator. Okay. And. So I didn't come up through whatever system there was, you know, sometimes you might start at the school board level or you might start at city council, you know. No, I, I ran for the state level and that was a God thing. It was a call. Okay. And I knew it was a call and I answered it. I ran it three, three months before the election okay. in a 60% uh, Democratic district. Wow. Yes, and so when I, and I won it against an incumbent whose family, he had the seat and his father had the seat before him for, what, 30 years? Wow. Yes, wow. and who am I? And but I God. won. They would say, but God. But God. <laughs> and by the way, no one would give me any money because they said you can't win. Why? Because here's the thing. In politics, they say, if you kill the king, then we're all safe. Wow. But if you just wound the king, then the rest of us are dead. Oh, wow. And they didn't think that I could win. They thought I would just wound him mm -hmm. and then there would be retribution. Well, we won. And, and the next race that I ran right after, and that was a calling as well, um, I ran for Congress. That was an absolute calling. I was running away from it. Right. And the Lord said, nope, you're gonna run there too. So I assumed well, I won the first one, I will win the second one because God has called me. But I forgot that God called the prophets to, and some of them were murdered, weren't they? Yes. yes. Absolutely. So I lost that race as the world says I lost it, but I did not because all God wants to know is, did you obey me? Wow. If you obey me, you win every time, even if they murder you. Wow. 
And so I will say to you, I won that race because I did what the Lord wanted me to do. We brought up the issues that we, you know, were important. The people didn't believe actually that the gentleman I ran against actually voted the way that, for example, one of the votes was that he took was that it was a First Amendment right to have computer simulated child pornography. Oh my goodness. Wow. The newspapers had done a story about that two years before. Do you know the same newspapers acted as if they had never heard that? Oh my goodness. And so I didn't have the money to deliver the message, but enough of the people heard it. They didn't believe it. So, you know, we get the leaders I think we deserve mm -hmm. sometimes. So they say I lost that one, but I won it. Well, I've been out of politics now for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And who comes back at this level? Second in command of the entire Commonwealth of Virginia, 8.5 some million people after being gone for 20 years and no one would give me any money. Once again, the story of my life. They th didn't think I could do it. Nobody remembers you when some, you know, you've been gone too long. Other people are more well-funded. My, my opponent outraised me almost three to one. Wow. Yes, I raised okay. about two million. She raised about six plus million. Wow. But I, I prayed David's prayers. David, you know, I said, please let them know about me through her That's commercials. It. That's it. And you know, I believe some people remember even your prior successes and your message then, and now their children are voting for you as well. You Isn't see? that something? So it's amazing the seeds. Yeah. You were sowing seeds all the way through. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. We're going to be coming to you twice a month on the podcast. I look back on where we are today and building AFPI, and I sincerely believe the time in the White House was actually in preparation <laughs> for what yeah. we're building now. Welcome to the show. I'm happy to say this to you. <laughs> you are one of my heroes. Human heroes. <laughs> I God, I mean, so. Jesus is my real yes, hero. Yes, yes. Who are some of your role models that have impressed you along the way? You know, my grandfather always talked about Churchill. And yes, uh, so I knew all about Churchill before we even went to school. Okay. And all about the U-boats and the Germans, you know, uh, and, and the barrels of oil in the sea. So I've always loved Churchill and the fact that he was willing to fight even when it looked like all was lost. Everything. He was not yeah. willing to go without a fight. Yeah. And then I love Maggie Thatcher too. Another hero of mine is a, a, another female, Golda Meir, the first yeah. prime minister of Israel. Yeah. Uh, the, just what she went through to become prime minister, you know, in addition to all the fights, but the, the fight amongst her own people. Yeah. Um, but when I think about your uncle and how, you know, he fought and how he was not loved. Right. And many people don't remember that, right. you know. His own people yeah. would say to him, we want you to leave. If you're doing you're, too much, you're you, endangering us. Yes, yes. you're creating yeah. problems Absolutely. from us. Uh, leave here. Reminds you of the prophet Amos. That's what mm -hmm. the people said to him. Go away from here. Go back to wherever, your sheep and whatever else. We don't want you here. We don't need you here. You see, Everything that's old is new again. This is the same thing. Nothing new. And you know, one of his favorite scriptures, let righteousness roll down as waters and justice yes. as a mighty stream out of the book of Amos. That was one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite scriptures, by the way. Look yeah. at that. Yeah. Look at that. But then I think about some of the mothers that I see who are struggling. And for example, at the hotel I'm staying, there's a, a woman, um, she's black single mother, and she's working two jobs. Goodness. And I said to her, why are you working? Because I have children wow. and I want better for them. Yes. And so she's doing the two, they're in school, they're in college now, and she's doing all that she knows to do. Goodness. That's my hero. Yeah. I, I was talking with someone the other day, um, young man, and he says to me, I'm so glad you're there. And I said, why? He said, because now I know that I can do it. So if the historic nature of my win 
helps people of all ages, of all stripes of God's colors of children. All ethnic groups. All absolutely. ethnic groups. Yeah. Immigrants, you know, women, men. Wonderful. That part about it I love. But the part I don't love is to you know, constantly say, well, she made history, she made history, because history is one day. Yeah. After that, everybody know, wants to know, well, how are you going to govern? What are you going to do? Yeah. How are you going to help the people? Yeah. That's what really counts. Can you answer that question? How are you going to govern? Well, I'm going to ensure that, well, first of all, I have a pin here, and it says, what does this say? FHB. FHB. Former has been. <laughs> I love it. I love I'm a it. Former oh has been. Oh. Because I was in politics, then I left, and I'm back again. Yes, you are. You know what it also stands for? Future has been. Yeah. One day I'm not going to be in office. Right. And so I must make the most of the time that I'm given. And it's not to put myself on a perch and lord it over the people. Because, you know, Job, the prophet Job said, if I lord it over my employees, what can I say to the Lord? Because he made us both. Yeah. And Peter said just about the same thing too. Well, I want to help. I want to ensure that education is available to everyone equally. I think the new racism is education, the redlining of education where my zip code dictates my educational opportunities. There are families I've heard from, families in the projects who want their children to go to different schools and they can't because of their zip code. Zip code says this is the school and only this school. My child doesn't get do-overs, as one, one parent said to me. I want more for my child. Now, the argument is we don't want public funds to go to private institutions. Wait a minute. We have SNAP food benefits. That's public monies that goes towards a private grocer. We have Medicaid and Medicare. That's public monies that goes to a private hospital, a private doctor, etc. We have Section 8 vouchers for rent. So that's public monies that goes to a private landlord. Wow. We have at the, at the college and university and trade school level, financial aid. So we have public monies that goes to private institutions. Yes, some, some public ones. So what if I said, your child wants to go to a college or a university? Well, he or she can only go to that college or university that's closest to your zip code and no other college, no mm -hmm. other is available mm -hmm. to you. You would see immediately, wait a minute, something is wrong with that. Right. Why can't we say that in the K through 12 foundational years? Wow. The school that I visited yesterday, yes. the children were already two grade levels behind. Mm -hmm. COVID hit. Our governor decided to close schools in the way that he did. And the, the principal tells me the children are now another two years behind. Another two, so they're four years. How can they possibly catch up? Right. We right. have to open the schools. The, the private schools figured this out a long time ago. They've been open right. five days a week for the past two years. Right. For the right. past two years. Right. So that's why. If you're not gonna open the schools, give the parents the opportunity to decide where they want to send their children so that they can learn. Absolutely. Well, thank you very, very much. And I believe as you speak, there's much hope ahead for Virginia. Mm -hmm. And it's not only this generation, but this decade. Truth mm -hmm. must be taught. Yes. And then implemented. Mm -hmm. And so I salute you. I salute the governor and the people of Virginia. Yes and just thank you so very much. Oh, thank you. And as we teach about history, yes, we teach about slavery, we teach about, I've already mentioned redlining, yes. and the horrible abuses that we suffered. Right. But you know, the slaves died in the fields wanting to be free. Yeah. Number one, right. they wanted their liberty. Number two, they wanted their families to be reunited. And number three, they wanted an education because then they could write their own ticket. And I think they would look at us and say, we died suffering horrible abuses. What is your excuse? Yeah. Not only are you bringing hope and solutions to the young people of Virginia, 
What would you say to young people across this nation today and maybe around the world? If you look at the glass as being half empty, mm. that's a negative way to look at life because life always hits you hard. There are no guarantees, even if you're rich. That's true. You could lose that money today and it's no guarantee of happiness, right? right? And, and, and so we don't look at the money. We look at the glass as being half full. Absolutely. To say it's half full, it, think about, for example, um, what we suffered um, in America and, and all of the country. People suffer, whatever mm -hmm. you know, color you are, whatever gender you are. But are you going to let someone's abuse of you dictate your future? Or are you going to say, this too, I will rise against because it is my life and I will succeed. I will overcome. I will make it. And somehow I will. I just will. Because some days you're the pigeon and some days you're the statue. <laughs> That's just the way life is. It is going to hit you hard. Yeah. How are you going to, you're going to ride it like a wave. Just say, no, no, no. This is, I. They're not gonna stop me here. I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep going because I guarantee there's someone who's suffering worse than you. Yeah. You've heard the old saying, I felt bad for myself. I pitied myself because I didn't have shoes mm -hmm. until I met the man who didn't even have feet. feet. I have heard that word. Yes. Absolutely. Keep going. Keep going, young people. Keep, Keep going. going. Yes. We need you. This yeah. is your future. This is. We need you. We need you to strive. We need you to succeed. We need you to thrive. So we're together in this generation, in this decade. Mm -hmm. And the young people should be glad that there is a Lieutenant Governor, <laughs> Winston <laughs> Sears, who's at bat for you right now. I think that's really amazing. I'm trying. You're doing good. In closing, are there any more thoughts or wisdom that you'd share? Be careful of who your friends are. You know, we've heard that growing up all our lives. Mom Absolutely. told us, grandma, grandpa, everybody told Everybody's us. Everybody's not your friend. You Everybody, hear that sometimes. That's right. Yeah. And, and so people are going to say things around you, and you're either going to be in that kind of conversation which will dictate your life, or not. Okay. There's a saying that I have, sit with the warriors. Mm. The conversation is different. Wow, that's so true. Wherever you want to be, go and find those people. Yes. Find those success stories. Go and sit with them. Make those people your friends. Not the folks around the corner. Not the people who aren't doing anything. There are people, I, I, I saw a meme the other day. It says, stay away from the still people. Still complaining, still broke, still whining, mm -hmm. you know, still unhappy. Stay away from those people. Right. Find the people that you want to be like. Yes. If it's business, go find someone and say, can you mentor me? Absolutely. If you're an artist, go find that person. Whatever it is you think you like to do, go and find them. Remember, it's your life. Yeah. Sit with the warriors and be an eagle. The symbol for America is the eagle. The eagle knows a storm is coming way before anybody else. Yeah. And when the storm comes, it flies into the storm and then flies above it and it rests in the storm. It does no work in the storm. The storm does not bother the eagle. What is the saying in Isaiah? We shall rise up with wings, wings like, like eagles, we, we shall wait run. Upon the Lord, serve the Lord, wait on the Lord, mm -hmm. and we'll rise up on wings yeah. like eagles. We shall run and not grow weary. Yeah. We shall walk and not, and faint. not faint. Guess what now? An eagle has a right wing and a left wing. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> so you've got your task before you here serving yes. all of Virginia mm -hmm. and uh, leading as a role model around this nation. And I just commend you and say God bless you. It's all him. I'm on a mission. Amen. Thank you again. <laughs>